Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Creating Just and Healthy Food Systems, the Role of Professional Associations. My name is Mark Muller, and I'm the Director of the Food and Community Fellows Program here at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. And this webinar is a part of a series of webinars that are put together jointly by us, the IHP Food and Community Fellows Program and Healthy Food Action, our colleagues also here at IHP. We're really excited about uh, today, and we have a, a large number of audience members, and many of you are obviously ex excited as well. I'm excited about this because I feel like professional associations, this kind of combines some of the grassroots and grass tops efforts that we have. As many of you know, there's a farm bill that is getting heated up right now in the Senate, and so there's lots of opportunities for grass tops action. And there's always opportunities for grassroots action working down at the very community level. I feel like this is a, a hybrid type of approach, a little, using a little bit of both. And our three speakers have combined, uh, have had really innovative approaches to making change through their professional associations. We're going to start with uh, Dr. David Walenga, who's here at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy and a senior advisor on science, food, and health. He'll be providing more of a big picture uh, view of working in professional organizations and using his experience with the American Public Health Association and American Medical Association. And then we'll transition over to uh, Angie Tagtow, a registered dietitian and an environmental nutritionist, and also a, a past fellow with the Food and Community Fellows Program. And she'll share her experiences and strategies for success working with the 72,000 member Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, formerly the ADA. And then finally, uh, we'll transition over to Cheryl Denley, Danley, a current IATP Food and Community Fellow. And I had the pleasure of, of joining Cheryl, uh, and she organized a great series of events at the recent Manners Conference, which is the Minorities in Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Related Sciences that took place last month in Atlanta. And she'll provide more of a case study of what she has done to help uh, uh, change people's perceptions of the food system within that professional organization. So without further ado, I'll be handing it over now to uh, David Olenga to give us the big picture view. David. Thank you, Mark, uh, and thanks for the invitation to uh, address the audience today on this topic. I'm going to give a little bit of a, a, a kickoff with sort of a big picture approach here, if I can get my slides to advance. There we go. Uh, and this is sort of a brief outline, starting off by asking, you know, why professionals, why do they need to get involved in these discussions around the food system? Well. I would start off by saying the urgency uh, of the need that obviously many, many of you all are motivated by the numbers around the obesity epidemic, not just the numbers of people affected, but the huge impacts on the healthcare system uh, on the order of $147 billion per year. And that's a pretty conservative estimate based just on direct treatment costs. It could actually be Three, three times higher or more every year. Um, but, but there's the food system is a very complicated thing, obviously, and, and there's more than just nutritional outcomes that are impacted. There's justice issues with questions around access to healthy food. There's national security concerns around whether we're going to have the farmers to grow the foods that we want people to eat. Uh, there's the intersection of certain climate change, but a lot of uncertainty around how well the crop systems that we use are going to be able to adapt to the extreme weather events and the changes in weather that we're going to see. There's antibiotic resistance, which is another epidemic, and um, the understanding that this is uh, being driven, at least in part, by the use of 29 million pounds a year of antibiotics in animal agriculture. And then uh, a second reason why professional associations should be involved are inertia. Systems, because they're big and interrelated, uh, and because there are actors, economic actors, that benefit from the existing system, are, do not change easily. Uh, so Kelly Brownell, for example, at Yale has written about analogies between big tobacco and possibly with uh, uh, the food system. And he makes the point that commercial interests 
will fight to suppress data and foster uncertainty, uh, making it harder to move forward on changes to the food system in this case um, w when it's in their financial interest to preserve the status quo. Of course, we, we saw that uh, around the uh, debates with environmental, uh, with, with tobacco use and control as well. Uh, and then another factor in inertia uh, with respect to the food system is that like tobacco, there's fairly few uh, uh, companies that control a large, a large part of the food system. So if you look, for example, at the top of the slide, these are different sectors of the food system involved with food processing, production, uh, and sales. And at the bottom, starting in 1990, is an indication of what percentage of that sector is controlled by just four companies. And so you look for beef packing, uh, and in 1990 it was 72 percent controlled by four companies. Flash forward 15 years, and the concentration of economic power gets even greater. And now we're already eight years beyond that. And, and there's little question that the, the top four companies control an even greater uh, uh, percentage of each of these food system sectors than they did in 2004. And if you look uh, in this graphic from Phil Howard, individual companies often are among those top four. Uh, across different parts of the food system. Uh, so the company in red, for example, or in yellow, uh, 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 have substantial market control uh, from animal packing industries to grain processing to, uh, uh, to other sectors of the, of the system as well. Now in terms of professional associations, they have the potential just by sheer numbers of providing a counterweight to the economic control exerted by these major players in the food system. And so within these associations, we're typically focused on membership of just that association. But when you start to aggregate, in this case, health associations, you see that the numbers add up quickly. So of the nurses, there's about 3 million in the US, of which the membership in just the ANA is maybe 180,000. Dietitians, I, I couldn't find a number nationally, but maybe Angie could uh, inform us of that. But in the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, about 72,000 members. Similarly, the AMA, 240,000 of maybe more than a million uh, MDs and osteopathic physicians. If you added in naturopathic and homeopathic physicians, the numbers would go even higher. Public health, another 25,000. And planners, that uh, you'll hear that there's been a lot of integration uh, with the planning community who's interested in food access and local food issues as well. Now, from their own parochial interest, professional associations also ought to be interested in food systems simply because it's a hot issue. And any membership organizations interested in getting new members. And indeed, uh, I think there's some good uh, evidence to suggest that by engaging around food systems issues, health and other professional associations uh, could be attracting newer and younger members around these areas. So new thinking, that's the third category uh, that I wanted to talk about with respect to professional associations. And basically, uh, the issue here is that if we think of the food system as a system, one of the things we know about systems is that you, when, when they start to break down, you can't change them for the better by using the same thinking that got you there in the first place. So let's just uh, walk through this evolution and thinking around food and health outcomes. For, for most of the recent history in the US, the health professions in particular have looked at uh, uh, diet and nutrition primarily as a function of individual behavior. And it's only in the last few years that uh, folks have started to question, particularly among obesity researchers, whether this is a good frame or even an accurate frame. Um, and instead are moving more towards uh, an environmental frame. Now with uh, 
communities putting prevention to work and other efforts occurring within communities, oftentimes this been, has been construed as creating healthy environments for eating and active living. But, but I would take things a step further because that frame leaves out the farm and everything upstream that happens in the food system before the food gets to the supermarket shelf. So uh, there's questions of farm and food policy, infrastructure investment, and the like. And I think if you bring those things into play, then a food environment or food systems uh, uh, way of thinking would encapsulate all of those. And indeed, if we look, there, there are actually some good examples starting in about 2007 with the uh, HEN work group that we're going to hear about from Angie Tagto, and then very quickly with other similar professionals within the American Public Health Association, folks starting to articulate more of a systems approach to food systems, one that aims for health and sustainability. And then uh, with some uh, help from the funder community, uh, uh, with a very small grant, the what was then the ADA, the Nurses Association, the American Public Health Association, and the Planning Association came together to articulate a common systems vision about the food system. So you see part of that here, and it deals with issues of equity or fairness, with issues of sustainability, resilience, diversity, and then health. And um, so one of the things I'll talk about later is the opportunity for other professional associations to contact us to add their names uh, to this core group that, that devised these principles. Again, with the thinking that if we have a common vision, uh, it's easier to build some momentum moving towards that vision. But how many knew on the call that the AMA, too, again, 240,000 members, has its own sustainable food policy, one that uh, was adopted by its House of Delegates in 2009, uh, and that led to a policy now that directs the AMA to support model a healthy and ecologically sustainable food system, to encourage the development of a system through the U.S. Farm Bill, very apropos of today, uh, and other federal legislation, and also to educate its own community and the broader community about the importance of healthy uh, and ecologically sustainable food systems. Well, it's one thing to do, adopt a goal statement. It's another to actually change the way we think and practice in our professions. And I wanted to just point to some very real challenges uh, between what I'll call the medical model, but I actually think it has been the dominant model for many of the professions uh, involved with health uh, and systems thinking. This new systems way of thinking about systems, whether it's climate change or food or, or other complex biologically based systems. While the medical model under which many of us were trained focused on individuals, a systems approach looks at the broader ecosystem or, or about communities as systems. The medical model tends to take a fairly reductionist view, the systems approach tries to look at the relationships between parts of a system. The medical model tries to identify a problem and then identify a discrete solution for that problem. The systems approach says it's not just one problem, and in fact, if you start zeroing in on a problem, it quickly morphs into a different set of problems. So rather, it's focused on identifying the components of resilience what makes the system work and function well. And so as a result, the medical model tends to be talked about in terms of identifying single causes and effects. In a systems approach, there is no cause and effect. And so you get a very uh, a specific uh, kind of gold standard for evidence in a medical model of a randomized control trial, or RCT, whereas in the systems approach, uh, uh, you may have evidence across many different domains of the system, and they may inform policy, but they don't uh, often come close to giving you sort of a magic bullet. So among next steps for professional organizations, I think there are several, depending on where you're at in the conversation in your organization. There, there's 
as I said, plenty of opportunities to sign on to that uh, principles for a healthy, sustainable food system, and I'd encourage you to consider that. There's a lot of work to be done with your own members, whether offering continuing education credits around these systems issues, partnering with groups like Healthy Food Action around webinar series, uh, and, and we've partnered with the Nurses Association and with the um, uh, Medical Students Association and others. Um, the, Within the APHA, for example, a group of food interested members from different parts of the organization realized that they needed a new working group to draw from those diff different parts around a food specific or food system specific uh, agenda. And then there's walking the talk. Are we at our meetings and conferences uh, modeling the kind of food system we want to see in the broader society? Um, are we offering fair wages or supporting hotels and other institutions that offer fair wages? Are we, uh, through the sponsorship that we pursue for these meetings, uh, uh, walking the talk? Um, and then finally, uh, can we ask our own organizations to take a policy position on important issues, maybe first by developing a policy statement, getting it approved by leadership, and then following up with, uh, for example, at the national level, letters to Congress, briefings on Capitol Hill, maybe individual members offering testimony, uh, and the like. And then finally, uh, new partnerships. Uh, how can we identify new and maybe unconventional partners, either at the national or local level? Let me wrap up by pointing to new partnerships around two specific important health issues. I mentioned antibiotics and the fact that 74% of all, uh, uh, excuse me, 80% of all antibiotics used in the country for any purpose are in fact used in agriculture. About three quarters of these are put into feed for animals that don't have clinical illness, but for purposes like growth promotion or feed efficiency. And virtually every public health authority in the country acknowledges now that this is helping to drive problems with resistance that are uh, then making their way into the hospital and other uh, human environments. And so what do we do about it? Um, I think our organizations can work together to try to bring about a different state of affairs. We, we use far more, uh, probably 10 times uh, or at least 4 to 10 times more antibiotics per kilogram of meat produced than countries in Europe do. There is a uh, legislation in both the House and the Senate that many of our organizations have signed on to, the AMA, the ANA, the Academy of Pediatrics, the APHA, and many, many others. Uh, this, but in the Congress that we have, this, this legislation uh, is still lacking significant bipartisan support. And one of the things that could change that is when professions, professionals and professional organizations uh, weigh in. And then the Farm Bill, a hugely important bill to f the food system, huge not just in terms of billions of dollars, but in terms of its scope. And it's up for vote, uh, or debate at least, uh, as early as tomorrow, uh, when we understand the Senate Agriculture Committee may start marking up or uh, kind of fleshing out its own version of the Farm Bill. The big challenge has been that historically, uh, rural, primarily rural legislators or legislators from rural states have been predominant on the agriculture committees and have ultimately written the farm bill in such a way that it continues to support just a few staple crops, many of which are now used for biofuels production or for feed grains, not so much for fruits and vegetables. And so uh, I wanted to just finish up by talking about a couple of efforts now uh, uh, around the Farm Bill. Literally today, if you're interested, would be the time to call the members of the Senate Agriculture Committee and voice your support for a healthier Farm Bill. There's a couple of specific efforts going on. Uh, Senator Leahy, for example, uh, has an amendment that, among other things, would direct the U.S. Department of Agriculture to make a report uh, back to Congress on the health impacts 
of the Farm Bill, um, which, which would be an important change. And then um, uh, other groups like uh, the Healthy Farms, Healthy People Coalition are newer coalitions to which your organizations could get involved with to create more of a common umbrella around the Farm Bill and other issues. Uh, and here is uh, their website. You'll see that ITP is on the steering committee, but also uh, Public Health Institute, Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, and others. Thank you. Uh, I ran a little bit long, but I want to uh, uh, warmly welcome now Angie Tagtow to do the next portion of the presentation. Thank you, David. And this is not Angie. This is Mark Muller, just uh, <laughs> the moderator bumping in to just say that I uh, forgot to mention at the beginning that we, uh, we're taking questions uh, through the chat box and I assume that all of you will see it's on the right hand side of my screen, a chat box and please feel free at any point to write in your questions there. We'll be aggregating them as the discussion goes on and then we hope to have the last 10-15 minutes of, uh, of this hour, maybe just over an hour to have some questions answered. And so now I will uh, turn it over to Angie to talk about the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Thanks Angie. Great, Mark. Thanks, thanks, David. The great introduction for the topic, and I want to thank IATP for this opportunity today. I also need to uh, preface my remarks that uh, I'm not representing the Academy of Nutrition Dietetics, but simply sharing my experiences as an Academy member, and specifically the work that has been done in advancing sustainable food and water system issues through the Professional Association. Just a little bit of background uh, on the Academy of Nutrition Dietetics, a recent name change from the American Dietetic Association just a few months ago. But the Academy is the membership and credentialing body for not only registered dietitians, but also for dietetic technicians registered. And we have currently about 72,000 members. And David, I did a quick look up, and I hope my numbers are accurate, but I think we have about 85,000 registered dietitians in this country. The organization has been around for almost 100 years and its uh, uh, structure includes not only affiliates or those state dietetic associations, there's also districts as well as dietetic practice groups and member interest groups and I think there are about 28 or 29 dietetic practice groups. Governance structure is pretty typical for a large professional association with a board of directors, have a house of delegates. We have many, many different committees and uh, there are staff in uh, Chicago as well as phenomenal public policy staff in Washington, D.C. So the perspective that I'm coming from today is the work that I do around environmental nutrition and oftentimes uh, Dietitians often get lumped into a single area of practice, but there's really numerous areas of practice within the profession of dietetics, including clinical, consulting, public health, food service management, of course academia, whether it's education and research, and we have lots of dietitians who work in industry as well. But the framework that I come from is really looking at that interconnectedness between the health of our natural resources to the health of our food system and to the health of eaters. And the work that I do uh, really looks at developing solutions and cultivating uh, sustainable food and water systems, whether it's in communication, education, and or policy. So to preface uh, what we uh, as dietitians often refer to as not just a definition of sustainable food systems but more characteristics of a sustainable food system and uh, working with Dr. Allison Herman for the last several years we assembled this uh, 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 statement a few years ago on a sustainable and resilient food system first and foremost conserves and renews natural resources it advances social justice and animal welfare it builds community wealth and last, it fulfills the food and nutrition needs of all eaters now and in the future. And so today I would like to use, um, kind of adopted this framework from the volunteer engagement period uh, pyramid. And uh, what I'd like to show is that there are many different levels of engagement within a volunteer, associate, volunteer professional association. But I think the theory behind uh, my model here is that as you move members uh, from being rather passive from that level one 
up to level three and being highly engaged especially on issues on sustainable food and water systems, the level of integration of these concepts inherently increases and become hopefully integrated not only within the profession and the practice of dietetics but also within the academy. And uh, you might also think that, well, Prochaska's stages of change might uh, be applicable here as well and, and it may, may indeed be. So I want to go through just a snapshot of some examples um, from my experiences using these different tiers as to how we've been able to advance sustainable food and water systems within the academy. I think first and foremost, anyone who is interested in this topic, um, to become a member of a specialty group within your organization. And I, I do want to give a shout out to the Hunger and Environmental Nutrition Dietetic Practice Group because they are the group that uh, see themselves as the most valued source of nutrition services who promote access to nutritious food and clean water from a secure and sustainable environment. I've been a member of this practice group since 2000 and that was when two practice groups merged, the Hunger and Malnutrition Practice Group and the Environmental Nutrition Practice Group merged. It's really great to see that this uh, uh, specific, uh, very vibrant and active work group has grown threefold just since 2005 and we are upwards of uh, about 1,400 members. Other ways of at least learning more about how to become engaged in a, in a specialty group or in a practice group is through listservs, by attending meetings and annual conferences. And the HEN DPG has done just an awesome job in, in recent years in incorporating farm tours and other special activities, including a film festival, which we highlight certain aspects of sustainable food and water systems as part of our educational events to members. And of course, most, most organizations are going to have a newsletter or e-zine or some sort. Uh, the next level really is to begin getting engaged and, and participate in activities. Some of the things that I've done over the years, um, although probably too many to list, but I got my toes wet by becoming the uh, assistant editor to the newsletter for the HEN DPG many, many years ago. This led to becoming the editor and then serving in other positions and in other capacities for the practice group. Other ways, uh, numerous, uh, reviewing various position papers. Uh, the Academy does have some relevant topics associated with sustainable food and water systems, including uh, uh, position papers on domestic uh, food insecurity, international hunger issues, as well as uh, sustaining ecological sustainability uh, also. Other ways of, of getting engaged, at least getting the topics out, is to propose discussion topics for the House of Delegates. House of Delegates serves somewhat as a, a group like Congress does, in which they uh, debate and propose uh, advances for the profession and for the association. Uh, back in 2005, I believe, or 2006, there was a proposal for the House of Delegates to uh, talk about a mega issue around sustainable food supplies. This actually led to the uh, creation of a background paper in preparation for this meeting. The outcome of that meeting was um, the development of a task force um, in which the task force was charged to create a document uh, and the, the, uh, the outcome was the healthy land, healthy people, building a better understanding of sustainable food systems for food and nutrition professionals. And this really became the first academy document that really outlined the role of dietitians in advancing sustainable food and water systems. Another area, and David already touched on this, uh, is the advocacy part. Um, I think to uh, just to dip your toe in is to become more knowledgeable about those pieces of national legislation that directly affect sustainable food and water systems. The Academy, of course, is very involved in um, a variety of, of legislation at the national level, you know, not only health care reform, but also child nutrition reauthorization, the Farm Bill, and Older Americans Act. And I think we need to uh, perhaps uh, leaven out, even out the learning curve on the issue of policy and dispel the notion that policy is beyond our scope of practice when in fact policy really dictates uh, not only what we can and can't do as uh, registered professionals but also 
allows um, us to be engaged in so many other things. I think one of the other biggest challenges, um, especially around the farm bill, being that David brought that up and that's kind of the theme for the week, is to convince other professions or professionals within the academy that indeed the entire farm bill influences the food system and that uh, just focusing all our energies on Title IV, or the, uh, the nutrition title, um, is, is definitely one component, but there are a lot other th more other things that impact our food system. I think uh, on another note um, that we have seen a lot of success on is uh, building alliances and, and building those relationships with other groups specifically on policy issues. And there's been a lot of changes within the Academy's DC office in which we've seen a lot of partnerships forged in the last couple of years and as well as uh, uh, picking on, on experts throughout the Academy to help with public policy uh, deliberation as well as the role of DPGs in supporting the DC office. Also looking at communication outlets and in, whether it's writing articles for newsletters or trade publications or journals, even connecting with the media uh, on these issues is another way of at least getting the word out. Moving on to the next level or the highly engaged level is to become an elected leader. Um, I had really a phenomenal experience being the chair of the HEN DPG in 2005-2006, but I will also admit that in addition to being an extremely rewarding uh, experience, it also was extremely frustrating at the same time. Uh, I also currently serve uh, as the first delegate of the uh, HEN DPG to the House of Delegates. This is a change in governance from the last a uh, couple of years in which um, it wasn't just affiliates that had representation on House of Delegates, but now affiliates and practice groups have representation on the House of Delegates. But there's other ways of getting engaged um, as an elected leader, whether it's at a district or uh, affiliate level as well. Also want to mention mentoring opportunities, and uh, not only do we have opportunities to uh, perform as a preceptor for dietetic internships, but I've also had uh, just phenomenal opportunities in working with graduate students across a variety of different uh, disciplines, specifically on uh, cultivating sustainable food and water systems. And I have to admit that I've been able to uh, learn just a tremendous amount from them. I think we also need to take advantage of any invitations that come our way for speaking and lecturing opportunities. Again, this can happen in a variety of levels, whether it's at a district level, an affiliate level, or even at the national level with our national conference, the Food and Nutrition Conference Exposition. Uh, there's also opportunities for uh, doing research, and uh, from that research, uh, publishing manuscripts or possibly even developing educational materials. Some of the things that I have done over the years have been developing uh, tools for not only registered dietitians but also for public health practitioners, linking those connections between the health of natural resources to the health of our food system to health outcomes of individuals. Talking about partnerships, uh, one of the I think most significant uh, opportunities that I've had is uh, was a invitation that came from a publishing house back in 2003. They saw the work of the HEN DPG and came to us and said, we're really interested in the types of things that you do. We really think that this would be a wonderful topic to uh, frame a new peer-reviewed uh, journal. And uh, we were, of course, a little overwhelmed by the invitation. And after about uh, 18 to 20 months of negotiations with the Academy on this new partnership between the HEN DPG and this publisher, um, in 2005, we were able to launch the very first issue of the Journal of Hunger and Environmental Nutrition. It's been uh, truly a wonderful experience, and uh, it's a partnership between the HEN DPG and Taylor and Francis Publishing. And we've been able to negotiate um, a, a pretty uh, a comfortable contract with the publisher in the fact that the electronic copy of, the, of JHEN is available as a member benefit. Uh, 
We also have the principles of a healthy, sustainable food system, which David had mentioned earlier, which is an ex excellent example of how several professional organizations have worked together to create this document. And if you haven't already looked at it, uh, I do highly recommend that you do that. And lastly, um, one of the current projects that I'm working on that really is taking, I think, not only the profession but the academy uh, to a new level is the development of standards of professional performance in sustainable food and water systems. This is a way of really integrating these con concepts, constructs, and competencies uh, into the dietetic profession and may actually lead to perhaps a specialty certification down the road. And just to wrap up with uh, another highly engaged uh, area that uh, members can be involved is uh, really looking at um, the way things currently are structured and thinking of the future. You know, it's often easier to, whether it's to complain or criticize about an organization, that it is to, you know, going forward and trying to make positive changes, especially as a volunteer or as a member of that organization. And, uh, you know, I, I think the Academy of Nutrition Dietetics is, is somewhat passive and conservative organization, and we don't often grant ourselves the liberty to challenge the status quo. Um, and, and if we do, um, to make sure that we do it in a professional and diplomatic manner. Fortunately, ADA does have a portal that uh, members can use to express their comments and concerns and their suggestions, and that's through issues management. And oftentimes, those concerns, they're, they're widely vetted throughout a variety of committees, um, have resulted in changes, whether it's in operational procedures, member services, uh, areas of practice, that type of thing. But one of the uh, hot button issues that um, I've had experience with was the release of the Food and Agriculture Biotechnology position paper. And uh, that paper, just to give you a highlight as to what the abstract read, was that uh, promoting the uh, use of agriculture and food biotechnology techniques that can enhance the quality, safety, and nutritional value and variety of food available for human consumption to increase the efficiency of food production, food processing, food distribution, and environmental waste management. The American Dietetic Association encourages the government, food manufacturers, food commodity groups, and qualified food and nutrition professionals to work together to inform consumers about this new technology and encourage the availability of these products in the marketplace. Well, many of you probably had the same response that I did and uh, thought that that wasn't quite a balanced uh, position statement that came on behalf of the organization. And so we challenged the Association Position Committee, which led to a disclaimer on the position paper, which then led to uh, a review by the Evidence Analysis Library, and then has now led to hopefully a new position paper due this year on technology and sustainable agriculture. And so challenging that status quo has made some difference uh, in that nature. David's already mentioned the issue of corporate sponsorship within the academy. Again, that's a very uh, hot topic, uh, especially among those within the HEN DPG. And uh, what we are doing is we are approaching this by actually using the principles of a healthy, sustainable food system as a guide to developing criteria that, um, that can be used to identify appropriate sponsors uh, for the association. And I guess just to highlight some of the lessons learned is uh, that it really takes um, not only good communication with um, directly with members, whether it's in a practice group, affiliate, district, or at the national level, with whether it's academy staff or leadership, but also to um, lend an a air of diplomacy in those negotiations. You definitely need to have a, a lot of patience in uh, being able to integrate these concepts into such a large organization, but the value of partnerships can't be um, stated enough. As well as, uh, you know, we need to motivate others to act, um, and that um, it's, it's, uh, they need a little bit of education to, to um, learn more about uh, how these things can be integrated and what they can do. And also, as a volunteer member of this organization, it's taken me many years 
of course, to learn the power to say no. Uh, because volunteerism can, of course, evolve into a full-time job. So just to summarize, um, a lot of things have happened in the last 10 years in integrating sustainable food and water system concepts within uh, this professional organization, and we have a lot more to do. So with that, uh, I will hand it over to Cheryl Danley, who's at the Center for Regional Food Systems at Michigan State University. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Hello, Cheryl, I think we can all hear you, if you want to go ahead. Okay, I was waiting for you to introduce me. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> oh, sorry. No. Okay, I'm Cheryl Danley, and I am with the Michigan State University Center for Regional Food Systems. And I'm having a little bit of trouble getting started here, so let me just um, go back to that. Okay. My role here at Michigan State University has been to work with the Kellogg Food and Community Program, which has an objective of working with communities for policy and systems change. And specifically at Michigan State, we had a program called Food and Community Connections. And the objective there was to work with national organizations that may not be viewing the food system in the same way that we were with a social justice frame, a healthy good food frame, and see what kind of room there was to introduce these new approaches. And my colleagues and I worked first with many national organizations, going to Washington, meeting with organizations that have national membership. And we got to the point where we had met about 80 different organizations, but we wanted to have a little bit more leverage, a little bit more um, power to affect change. And so little by little, we began working with clusters of organizations that represented a particular field. Uh, one colleague of mine focused on local governments because she was a planner and that was similar to her background. Another one focused on financing farming in the U.S. because she worked more in the community economic development area. And another one worked on farm to pre-K or early childhood environments because her work is in education. And in my area, I wanted to focus on diversity, multiculturalism, and inclusion, because I had noticed that many of the national organizations that we had visited had not really been as representative as I thought they should be. And in my own experience, being an agricultural economist who's worked in food and resource economics, I knew that there were probably more people out there like me, who were people of color, who had had more of a traditional type of training, who maybe weren't aware of the food system work or the food advocacy work as I had not been up until about five years ago because I was more in a traditional, conventional agricultural frame. So my thought was to try to work within my own field with agriculturalists first and with an organization that deals specifically with students of color, helping to mentor them, helping to give them career opportunities. And I really have to say that I modeled my approach somewhat after the approach that Angie took, even though I hadn't met her, but I had been very impressed with the publications that came from the American Dietetic Association about how people in different areas of dietetics could take on a sustainable agriculture 
or food systems lens. So in my approach, it's sort of four simple steps. I sort of scanned the environment to look for opportunities to have an impact. And in this case, I worked particularly with, with this national organization that I'll tell you about. And then I looked for allies. After that, I decided, well, where can we have some influence? Where are the places where people are listening or where they get their information from either their national organization or from their local chapters. In some ways, this strategy was both a ground up and a top down strategy. And the third point I'm making is offer help. This probably collapses almost all of the three stages that Angie talked about. So in the beginning, I discovered that they are always looking for content to go on their websites. They're looking for workshop topics. So they're looking for keynote speakers. And so in that way, I was helping them with the solution, even though they might not have been aware that I had a particular orientation that I was sharing. And then finally, uh, to reinforce the new relationship and the new information. So let me introduce a little bit MANNERS. MANNERS is the National Association of Minorities in Natural Resources and Related Sciences. And this organization has been in operation 27 years. And I was around when it first got started, because there were many students of color who were in land-grant universities and colleges who felt a bit isolated, and they hadn't gotten enough support or mentoring from the large institutions. So they really formed this support network. And over a period of years, it's gone from 30 members to more than 1,300. And it's the most diverse organization of its type. And there is really no other organization exactly like it, because most of them tend to be narrowly cast around a particular discipline, be it animal science or agricultural economics or nutrition or natural resource management, for example. So the National Association or the National Society for Minorities in Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Related Sciences is really the one place that many employers will go to seek some of these bright, promising young people to, to fulfill some of their diversity quotas. If you look at the membership historically, it has been more African American members, followed by Latinos, and now increasingly other white students, Asian Americans, Native Americans. And they don't turn down membership to anyone. So everybody is welcome. And the membership includes both the students as well as faculty members or other professionals who are mentors to these students. So what I looked at first was how many times in their workshops had they focused on policy issues or issues of social justice. And I found that there were very few. These students tend to be heavily recruited and mentored by people in academia, people in government, and people in the private sector, agribusiness and food industry. But they very rarely saw opportunities in policy work or working with not-for-profit organizations. So the first ally I sought was Professor Eunice Foster, who in fact was the founding member of the National Society. And she's here at Michigan State University. She's a former associate dean. And she came from a more traditional bent. But over a period of about a year, I would suggest to her the kind of work that we were doing with sustainable agriculture, with food systems, bringing her in to help her understand the kind of environment that the food movement is now creating. And I have to say, from our experience, it's always been kind of surprising that we have these two groups of people that are completely in silos. The people who are doing the food movement don't necessarily know about the professionals of color and vice versa. So once I talked to 
Professor Foster, I asked her, are there any other people that you've worked with over the years in land-grant institutions who might be open to some of these ideas of food justice, food policy, and uh, alternative agriculture. She recommended a few people, and I started networking with them to see where we could have leverage. Another point of leverage was to work within my own network. And now that I am a food and community fellow, we have access to all of the previous fellows as people that we can call on. And one person that I did call on was Dr. Eduardo Sanchez to see if he wouldn't mind being a speaker at one of these national conferences. Eduardo Sanchez had worked with us in the Kellogg Food and Fitness Initiative, and I knew that he often talked about bridging health and agriculture. So this was kind of a policy approach that I thought the Manners organization would be open to as they designed their conference. And to push the idea a little bit more, I suggested, well, this is a year where the Farm Bill is being discussed, where we have an election year, and wouldn't it be useful to introduce these students to more than just the disciplines that they are studying in? Wouldn't it be useful to bring a policy focus to the conference? And to my great surprise, they accepted the recommendation, and we proposed six workshops and two keynote speakers, and Dr. Sanchez was one. So again, as I was saying, proposing solutions. This really helped them not have to go out and look for speakers. And also, we had some access that this organization might not have had. When I spoke to them, they had said that they were interested in getting some government official, maybe at a cabinet level, like the EPA uh, administrator, or secretary of agriculture, or something like that. But over a period of months, I saw that they really weren't getting to that point. This photo here is one of the workshops that we finally organized at the conference. And it was actually organized by one of our community, food and community fellows, Kelvin Braddock. And this is a picture of Kelvin Braddock. He's a young man who's still in college himself, but who has decided to revitalize the cooperative in West Georgia that his grandfather started. And when I proposed working with Kelvin to the Manners organization, they were thrilled because they thought having a young person like this who was a social entrepreneur would give these students an idea that they had not thought of. Most of them think about graduating and getting a job, but very few of them look into farming as a career or working in an enterprise that they start by themselves. In addition, over the years, Manners has moved beyond just working with college students to build a pipeline of high school students. And they call those junior Manners. Many of the chapters have junior Manners, high school kids that come to the conference. And Kelvin was very, very influential with these high school students. I think they were very impressed. Another fellow that we proposed in this conference was Hailey Johnston, who was also a social entrepreneur, having started the common market. And I think, again, these examples of working within the good food movement but still making money was something that was new to some of these students. Finally, we also were able to get a keynote speaker, Dr. Joe Leonard, who is the Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights. And he really spoke to the students about their responsibilities in social justice, no matter where their career takes them. And his words were actually so moving for some of the students that we have since interviewed him so that we could then capture what he said in future publications that the organization puts out. 
For example, they have a magazine, the Network Matters Today, that comes out twice a year. So we'll have the interview with the assistant secretary, as well as some stories that follow up on the workshops that we had proposed. Uh, another example of the workshops that we had were with Malik Yakini, who is from the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, who talked about food justice and about community organizing. We also had Lydia Villanueva talking about food justice and community organizing with the Latino community in southern Texas, in northern Texas. So these are just examples of things that had not been proposed before. And similarly, we have a graduate student who has sat on the editorial board of this magazine, and she was also saying they are always looking for content. And we think it's better that we provide the content than they get it from the corporate sector, because the corporate sector is only too eager to sponsor the conference, to brand some of the concepts, such as sustainable agriculture, for example. Monsanto was a large sponsor this year, and they were the ones defining sustainable agriculture. But I think it's important for us to help present a variety of viewpoints that the students might not have seen before. And uh, with that, I'll thank you very much, and uh, we'll take questions as a group. Great. Thank you, Cheryl. This is, that was wonderful to provide that on-the-ground uh, examples of, of making change in a professional organization. So we're getting close to the top of the hour, but I have at least two questions of a series of questions that came in that I'd love to throw out to our, our panelists. And the first one, I believe, was probably instigated by uh, one of David's uh, charts that he showed that had the AMA, ADA, APHA, all these different professional organizations. And the person asked, I think I get confused by all the groups that look like they're doing very similar work. Is there one that is really leading the efforts? Do any of you three have a, uh, someone that you throw out is really leading the efforts? Well, I think, you know, the, the, the challenge and, and also the beauty of professional organizations is they each have their own priority list for their members. And so, you know, it depends on which issue you're talking about. The food system's so big and complex uh, that, that whether you're talking about, um, you know, opportunities for beginning farmers of color, there would be one set of organizations. If you're talking about issues around access to healthy food, it might be another. I would say the, this coalition that I mentioned that's pretty new, we've been around for about a year and a half, Healthy Farms, Healthy People Coalition. It's just getting off the ground, which is an opportune time to weigh in uh, and become involved because it's uh, the first, uh, uh, if you actually go to the website, which is hfhpcoalition.org, their first uh, web forum is tomorrow, and it's going to be kind of an introduction to the coalition. Because the, the, the problem is that for a lot of professional organizations, food systems are not the top issue. So they get um, more focused on, you know, whatever the health care reform issue is of the day or you know, reacting to some particular thing. And so we sort of have to create new food system specific uh, um, opportunities and coalitions and ways of working together. This is Angie. I, I agree with David's comments. I think each organization has uh, inherent roles and um, based on the, the area of expertise is going to bring a certain aspect and asset to the table. And I think what's going to take everyone forward is these collaborative efforts, uh, such as uh, the ones that we mentioned today. Great, thank you. All right, a second question, um, and this I think goes directly to some of the work that Cheryl's done, and I know all three of you have, have touched on this topic, but um, how can we ensure that sustainability and sustainable food solutions reach and enrich marginalized communities? I'll start with Cheryl. Do you have any immediate thoughts on that? Well, I've always thought that we look at the way that marginalized communities seek information. There are people who will try, try to send 
information out on emails and listservs, but that might not be the way people get their information. They might get it from their affinity groups, from organizations, from church, from community, from people that they trust. And so going back to my point about scanning the environment, part of that is looking to see where people get their information from. Well, I, I, I had the pleasure yesterday of, of, of being at a conference with Ricardo Salvador, and he had an interesting analogy. Uh, he said that basically, and, and I'll take the liberty of paraphrasing him, that you know much of the discussion today is around uh, how do we continue to have cheap food for people. And he said, you know, really, being saddled with this idea that food uh, ought to be a certain price and as cheap as possible is sort of like the the ripple effect of 200 years of 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 involving underpaid or sometimes uh, um, you know enslaved populations heavily in the food system, and we're still seeing the repercussions of that. And so, in many cases, we have to totally change the conversation around the food system and start with the idea that it's got to, first of all, pay the people involved in the system fairly, and second of all, pay them at a level where they can buy the food they're helping to produce and process. Great. And I have one final question that came in that um, I think would be interesting. Is there an opportunity to work with professional associations comprising of food industry professionals? I can't believe that everyone working in the food industry is against sustainability. And I know that none of you have said that and wanted to say I know that Manners and many others do have professional uh, professionals in, in, uh, in corporations that are part of it. And do you want to comment on that at all? <laughs> I'd like to take that a little bit because I do agree with the person that sent the question. One of my colleagues in some of this work had worked for Cargill, and um, he's now doing more work with the National Good Food Network. And I asked him about the people he had worked with, and he said there are probably a number of people, but we have just not reached out to that community of people. Sometimes we are insular and in only talking to the people that have the same viewpoint that we have. And I would encourage people to start building um, allies in the industry as well as some people that you might think are in conventional agriculture and academia. They just might not have ever been exposed to some of these opportunities here. And the here living in Iowa, of course, we have um, um, a lot of food policy issues uh, coming out of Iowa and um, a lot of dominance by agribusiness and, and the food industry. And I think the most traction that, that we've garnered here in Iowa is also looking at uh, uh, food industry that are smaller in scale, whether they're, they're local or regional uh, food producers and processors and having those connections. We're finding a lot more traction there. Um, because if you think about the food system and the different tiers of the food supply chains, we often gravitate towards those national and global uh, uh, suppliers. And uh, in fact, we have uh, just as many uh, small, mid, and uh, uh, regional types of uh, food supply chains in which we can also connect with. And we're actually getting more traction with partnering with those folks. Great. Thanks, Angie. You know, one last question just came in I thought was very intriguing, and I think it goes exactly to what David's doing with Healthy Food Action. It says the doctors have such high prestige in our society. It seems like it would do a tremendous amount of good if they became more vocal on these issues. Is, is it that medical professionals generally leave that sort of thing to associations? Is that why we don't hear more from them? Well, I think it's a lot of things. It's um, a lot of the food-related issues are quite foreign to physicians because their exposure to even basic nutrition is so limited. Uh, even if they're passionate about you know, eating well or food policy change, they might not feel very comfortable speaking out about it unless it's within the professional association. But I think this is changing, uh, and it's a testament to all of our efforts. Um, I, I think we just need to continue to find new ways to engage individual 
health professionals of all ilks uh, who want to become advocates. And so, you know, I mentioned Healthy Food Action, and one of the purposes behind that is to provide a new outlet for individuals to take action uh, without sort of needing the their professional society to make that issue a major priority. Uh, but there, there are many other um, avenues as well, especially at the local level. We didn't talk much about new partnerships between health professionals and schools around healthy school food, uh, uh, partnerships on food policy councils at the local level, and the role that physicians and others can play in those bodies. And I think those are all good and increasingly abundant opportunities. All right. Well, thank you, David, Angie, and Cheryl. And I just want to end with this last comment that I received. It says, praise for you three. Thank you so much for this. I've recently questioned whether I want to continue being a member for some of the reasons you mentioned. But your presentations give me hope. Thank you. <laughs> so on that, um, I'll say thank you to you all and to the couple hundred people that participated in this webinar. I hope that this gives you some incentive to continue being involved in your professional associations. And uh, please remember that we have a farm bill that's out right now in the Senate Ag Committee. And look at Healthy Food Action. Look at, uh, I have a Facebook page, Understanding the Farm Bill. Look at, there's a Farm Bill Visualizer. There's lots of different tools. But this is a great opportunity to get involved. Uh, thanks again, and uh, I hope to see you at the next webinar.